Hallelujah. Praise the Lord and good morning everyone. Hallelujah. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Amen. Let us all stand in the presence of the Lord and let us all bring our attention and focus to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It is because of him that we are here. It is because of him that we are alive. It is because of him that we have seen new mercies every morning. Amen. Great is his faithfulness. So great is his faithfulness. He has been so good to us. He has been so, so, so good to us. And for all the love that he showers on us, for all the grace that he showers on us, let us give our praise and our full attention and focus and our full worship to him this morning. Amen. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Lamb who was slain for us, who gave his life for us so that we could be saved. Amen. Let's worship together. Rejoice in the Lord this morning. upon the throne to receive praise to receive praise glory and honor glory and honor forever and ever and ever and ever hallelujah 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 he is the alpha and, and the omega beginning and the end he is the first and the last first and the last he is the king of kings and the lord of lords forever
raise your voices unto the Lord and give him your praise this morning. He is holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. There is none like him. Heaven and earth and the angels bow down before him and they magnify him and they continually sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Holy, holy, holy is the one who gave his life for us. There is none like him. There is none like him. There is no one like our God. There is no one like our God who moves among us, who moves among us, who knows the very thoughts in our heads, who knows the tiniest desires of our heart, who knows us the way no one else in this world knows us, who understands us the way no one in this world understands us, who knows the very intent of our hearts. Give him praise this morning. He is worthy, worthy, worthy. Hallelujah, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Our hearts are full of gratitude this morning. Our hearts are full of praise this morning. Lord Jesus, for you are great, and you are greatly to be praised, and you are the one who makes ways for us, and you are the one who opens doors for us, and you are the one who makes ways in the desert, who brings springs of waters in the desert. When we cannot see an answer, you are there. When we feel hopeless, you are there. When we find no way, you are there. You're a God who makes new ways for us, God. You're a God who heals all our diseases. Bless your name. We bless your name. We can never forget your benefits towards us, God. We can never forget your benefits towards us, Lord. Great is your faithfulness, Father. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. Our way maker, our miracle worker. There is none like you, O oh Lord. Thank you for moving in our midst. Thank you for touching our lives each and every day. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for intervening in our situations. We give you praise, Abba. We give you praise, Lord. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeps light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are.
this morning. There may be something weighing down heavy on your heart. He is here. He is here. He is here to mend your heart. He is here to hear your words that are not spoken. He is here. He's seeing the tears that you cry. The things that no one knows. He is here. He is here. His grace is here. His unconditional love is here. He is hugging some of you. He is touching some of you. He is healing some of you. Just receive it in Jesus' name. Because He is here. Jesus is here. Jesus is here. Those who are hungry will be filled. Those who are thirsty will be filled. Jesus is here. He is the God who keeps His promises. He is the God who never fails. He will never fail you. He will never fail you. You can trust Him. You can trust Him completely. My God, that is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you work it. Even when I don't feel it, you work it. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you work it. Even when I don't feel it, you work it. Hallelujah. You never stop Hallelujah. He never you stops never working. Stop. He is always stop working, working in the background on your behalf. He is always working on your behalf. The battles that you cannot fight, He is fighting for you. Where your voice is not heard, He is speaking for you. You never stop speaking for you. Even when I don't see it, you work. Do you trust Him this morning? Do you trust Him this morning? You never stop working. You never stop working. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you work working. Even when I don't feel it, you work working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you work working. You never stop. You never stop working. He never stops. He never stops working. Even when I don't see it, you work working. Trust Him completely. 
when you see no way you can trust him when you feel hopeless you can trust him because he is a faithful god that is who he is he is a good good father that is who he is that is who he is there is no other way that he is he is just a good good father and he is just a loving father and he is always there he is always there for his sons and daughters who are always calling out to him who are always reaching out to him who are always standing on his word who are always looking to him their faces are always radiant those who look to jesus their faces are always radiant those whose focus is on jesus their faces are never put to shame their faces never bows down low because our god is our glory the lifter of your head the lifter of your head the lifter of your head hallelujah thank you jesus thank you jesus thank you jesus only one name thank you for making that way for us jesus thank you for dying for us on that cross thank you for coming down for us lord jesus that is the only way we could have been saved that is the only way we have this assurance day after day after day that we never have to fear our tomorrows because you live and you are alive and you are with us and you are in us and you are around us and so we never need to fear we never need to fear we only need to have one name on our lips on our doorposts on our windows wherever we go only one name and that name is Jesus only one name and that name is Jesus it doesn't matter what is happening around us it doesn't happen what is what is happening that one name is greater than any other name and greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world hallelujah just one name we thank you lord jesus we thank you jesus
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. Let us all just lift up our hands and worship this morning. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. We just sang that there is salvation in one name. That at, that, at this name that every knee shall bow. Every tongue will confess that he is God. Hallelujah. And there is none like him. Hallelujah. And he's soon coming to take his church. Hallelujah. Oh, let us just worship this King of Kings this morning. The Lord of Lords, he's here in our midst this morning. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, there is salvation. In only the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, Rikaba Baba Shikhe Rebebe Shandaru Bori Karaba. Oh, Rilla Lava Shikhe Rebebe Shandaru Bori Karaba. Oh, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Dear people of God, as we are standing in our places this morning, let us lift up our nation, the nation of India, into God's throne. And let's just pray for India. As we sang that there is salvation in one name, the name of Jesus. Let's declare the salvation of Jesus over the nation of India. Hallelujah. Let us just bless our nation. Hallelujah. Let us, let us just bless all the states, all the union territories. Hallelujah. All the cabinets, all the ruling governments. Let us just pray and commit them into God's hands this morning. And let us just pray, God. We want to see your glory in the nation of India. Hallelujah. We are going to enter into the elections in this year. 2024 is the year of election. Let us just pray that Lord, we want to see your glory. Your glory revealed in these elections. Hallelujah. Those that every person, every party will come to know and acknowledge that there is no one but one. The name of Jesus who still rules over the nations. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This morning, if you have your Bibles with me, please turn to the Gospel of Mark. Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 11. Mark, chapter 11. This morning, as we meditate on what God's Word says and what the Holy Spirit would like to impress upon us today, I just pray that God would give you listening ears, that the Holy Spirit of God would anoint your ears to hear what he has to say and give you eyes to see what he wants you to see. And this morning as you receive this message, I just pray that it would sink into your hearts because this is the heart of God speaking today. Early this morning when I was praying, that was my prayer. I said, Holy Spirit, you be the one to speak because this, what I'm about to share is something that has been a heavy burden on my heart for the last few weeks. And uh, this morning I believe that's what the Holy Spirit wants to impress upon us today. And so let us read the gospel according to St. Mark chapter 11. We're reading, we're looking at verses 15 to 19 where it says, On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. Holy Spirit of God, this morning I pray that you would speak to us, you be the one to speak into our hearts and speak into our spirits, you be the one to search our souls, and I pray that nobody would be distracted, O oh Lord, this morning, but all attention will be focused upon you and the word, and I pray that nobody will be tempted to fall asleep, and nobody will be distracted by electronic devices, but all attention will be drawn to you. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. This morning I would request you, I would urge you rather, to keep your Bibles with you, the Holy Bible and not your cell phones. Your cell phone is not a holy phone. It's not dedicated to the Lord. And it's not only the Holy Word that is found in it. I may even go as far as saying that 
to a certain extent some of your phones may even be corrupted by the contents that are there in the phone and so which is why we should not be distracted by what we hold in our hands that is why the printed word of God is the most advisable thing to carry but if you are able to avoid being distracted using uh, an electronic device you are welcome to do so but do not be distracted praise the Lord this morning as we read in uh, as we read in, in in this passage we see a picture of Jesus that we normally do not see nor do we associate with Jesus we know Jesus to be the gentle shepherd the lover of our souls we know him to be a loving savior a compassionate friend we know him to be a kind and a gentle shepherd that's the picture that we have of Jesus what we just read is a picture that you would never associate with Jesus how would you picture him with a whip in his hand how would you picture him driving people away from wherever they were stationed in the temple how would you picture Jesus disturbing the atmosphere that is prevalent in the temple how would you picture Jesus doing any of what we just read it is very difficult to picture Jesus and to reconcile the image of Jesus that we have with what we just read in fact we could almost interpret his actions as very very um, unspiritual if I may use the word you, you cannot imagine Jesus to use a stick or a whip but then the word says he did not use the whip he held it and he did whatever we just read this is this account in Mark is probably the second time that Jesus did this the first time he did something similar is found in the gospel of John chapter 2 and this was at the beginning of his ministry whereas this account we read here is towards the end of his ministry just before he was going to ride into or he had just ridden into Jerusalem as king now when you read the scriptures when you read the gospels you will not find a repetition of an incident such as this you will find it just once except of course the feeding of the crowd one time Jesus fed 5,000 men and the other time he fed 4,000 men but besides these one or two incidents you do not see a repetition of incidents especially of this nature why was it that Jesus got very upset what was it that ticked him off so much why did he almost go bonkers why when you read this you must pause to try and understand and grasp why Jesus would do something like this we read about the temple we read about these people in the temple we read about the buying and the selling that was happening there we read about the money changers and those selling doves and then we read about people who were carrying merchandise through the courts now if there was something that really ticked off Jesus it had to do with these categories of people so let me ask you did these people belong in the temple the answer is yes they belonged there why they were facilitators for the worshipers you see the temple and this temple that we're talking about is the second temple it is not Solomon's temple Solomon's temple was destroyed by the Babylonians about 600 years before Christ the second temple was constructed by Herod 
as, as a gift to the Jews. And it, it, was, it was a grand thing. It was nowhere near the splendor that Solomon's temple had. But it was a big deal. And so in those days, people from all over the world would come to this temple for offering sacrifices. They would come in during the Passover. They would come in at different times of the year for different festivals. They would come there. And since they came from different countries, far off places, sacrifices would involve goats and cows or bulls and doves and pigeons and stuff. You cannot imagine them carrying those sacrifices from those far off countries. So what they would do is they would travel with money and they would come to the temple and then buy the sacrifices there. Of course, they had to make sure that the sacrifices were without blemish, without spot or wrinkle, and they were perfect and acceptable as a good offering or sacrifice. So these people who were selling animals and birds, they were there to help the worshiper. What about the money changers? Same thing. You had people from other countries. They would bring in their currency, but the temple had one currency which they accepted, the temple did not accept any other currency. So they had to change their money from their currency to temple currency. That is why the money changers were there. And so the money changers were also there to facilitate. Facilitate the worshipper. If that is the case, what went wrong? Why was it that Jesus was upset? Because these people obviously, they belonged there. What about those carrying merchandise? Well, by that time, you know, the, the walls of the temple, there were certain gaps. Some places the walls were broken. And so it, you had a rectangular or a square-shaped complex, uh, the, 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 the complex of the temple. And there were porters who had nothing to do with the temple or the people in the temple. They had to, the, along the path that they were traveling from one city to the other, they would have to skirt around the temple walls and then continue their journey. But you know how especially Indians love to take shortcuts. Any available space, take a shortcut. We do not care about keeping discipline or maintaining discipline. We just see one small gap and we want to make use of it. Best example are traffics. Stick to your lane. No, there's plenty of space. I can go in and I go and I make, a, I plug that opening. You know, so these guys, porters, shortcut. There are openings in the wall. Why not? Why go all the way around? Let's just go through the temple. And they had nothing to do with the temple. And all of this, except for the porters, the others who were there to facilitate the worshippers, they were supposed to contribute towards the atmosphere of the temple. What was the atmosphere of the temple supposed to be? It was supposed to be an atmosphere of worship and of prayer. An atmosphere of worship and of prayer. The entire complex. That was what God intended it to be. But soon what happened, just as in the beginning, corruption set in. And these guys who were there to be facilitators they turned businessmen they corrupted the atmosphere by their business dealings when we talk about ministry in the church and this is especially for the different teams that we have whether it's the worship team the media team the technical team the, the volunteers team, the, the Sunday school, the youth team, the various teams that we have, or any of you who are involved in any kind of ministry. The question to ask is, it is not if you do the ministry. You are all called to do the ministry. But the question is, how do you do the ministry? With what spirit inside of you do you do the ministry? What is your attitude when you are ministering? We had a young man, a few, uh, last year in fact, who was part of our media team. And this guy had to leave and, and go to another place. To join a similar, a similar profile, 
he was part of the media team of another church but in our interaction with him he made a confession he said when i was in lucknow while i would handle the camera i was able to worship along with the congregation even if i'm handling the camera but where i am now i'm not able to do that because it is so technical and it is so uh what's the correct word to use he is not able to worship and that is the most important thing for anybody who is involved in any kind of ministry to have inside of you it's not necessarily just inside the church any ministry outside the church as well many of you are involved in different ministries it is not if you are doing the ministry it's not where you are doing the ministry it is how you are doing the ministry with what spirit are you doing the ministry did these people that we read about did they have the temple spirit inside of them did they make their spirits one with the spirit of god who was present there were they serving with that spirit while exchanging currency or while selling the animals for sacrifice they slowly turned it into a business and they started overcharging they started turning it entirely into a business for profitable gain for the self and that corruption was something that god could not stand he was not because this temple he had declared it he had declared he you read it in the book of isaiah jesus was just quoting one of the prophets he was quoting isaiah where god said my house shall be called a house of prayer but you have corrupted it and you have turned it into something else we are supposed to serve god with his heart with his burden with his passion not ours because if we serve god with our heart with our passion we will bring in our earthly emotions we will bring in our earthly understandings we will be driven by what drives us physically or mentally but we are supposed to serve god with his heart we are supposed to have a burden that is from him we are supposed to be passionate about the things that he is passionate about we must always remember that god is not going to share his glory with anybody else absolutely anybody else even his own servants he will not share his glory with his own servants as well he will he is very jealous in a very righteous way we need to understand that we need to understand the spirit that god is looking for and so when we read the passage which says god the father is looking for people who will worship him in spirit and in truth it is not talking about the holy spirit and in truth it is talking about our spirit it says our spirit we should worship him through and in and with our spirit which is based on truth and so this morning ask yourself this question how do you doing whatever we are doing are we doing it for god's glory or are we doing it for ourselves are we doing whatever we are doing to draw attention to ourselves now picture this these guys who are selling uh, the animals and birds for sacrifice or the month exchanging money they are supposed to be quiet and very quietly transact with whoever comes in and let them be on their way but there was a lot of noise there was a lot of commotion there was a lot of things that were happening that spoiled the entire atmosphere in that temple are we bringing a secular spirit into the sacred because all that i just spoke about belongs in the secular field it belongs to the secular market it does not belong in god's house anything for personal gain is not to be exercised in god's house 
there is always this danger of bringing in the sacred uh, secular spirit into the sacred you know yesterday i i i happened to come across a video on youtube of an incident that happened in the church very recently i believe it was in the state of texas in the united states something that was so so shameful i felt like oh i don't know how to describe what i felt like this was around the time you guys have your super bowl or um, rugby you know one of those things what's the game that you kick the ball in soccer is it american football is there a national league for this yeah all right so that's what i'm talking about and so there's this big mega church that boasts about 25 30000 members in that church and it's not a church that you are thinking about i have not even heard the name of this church before and the video was being made by a a, a person who wanted to expose this so it was just a one and a half minute video and in that video there was this lead up to this national sporting event the american football uh, national leagues and americans they love their baseball and then after that they love their football uh, so around baseball they go crazy football i do not know i'm not very sure but okay and so you have this picture now picture this the senior pastor of that church he has two pastors under him and so the second pastor he he holds what would seem to be the american football now this is oblong in shape all right it's not round it's oblong and so one person stands there and holds the ball upright while someone else comes and kicks it and so this associate pastor was holding this there ready for someone to come and kick and this is happening on the altar the background screens are displaying what you would normally see on the stadiums where the game is happening this is happening in church on stage the senior pastor is coming to kick that ball on stage do you know what the ball was it was a copy of the holy bible crazy crazy who would think of doing such a thing with the holy word of god i will try and post that video on the church whatsapp group kicked someone was at the other end of the stage trying to catch it but it did not go there it went into the audience and the narrator of this video question did not any of the church members question the pastor how dare he do such a thing we talk about bringing the sacred uh, the secular into the sacred space a few months ago i told you about the hillsong church and i don't hesitate to name this church because they have been very shameful in some of the things that they have done in the past the last few christmases that they've had the programs that they've had have all been based on uh, uh what's that word uh, broadway broadway along the broadway uh, uh style they would do crazy things it's all on video the other picture that i saw yesterday was this pastor the same pastor who kicked the ball a few weeks ago before that there is this song by a secular guy who is uh, who sits on a wrecking ball and he's swinging on a wrecking ball anybody know miley cyrus this pastor he emulated miley cyrus on stage he sat on a wrecking ball and he's swinging not just once seven eight times uh, and he's saying something to the audience and on the background screen you can see the singer singing that song but without the volume you talk about bringing the secular into the sacred you know how you felt when you heard about the pastor kicking the bible 
Do you know how much more it pains our heavenly father? How much more it pains Jesus our savior who paid a great price by laying his life, by shedding his blood. When we take the things of God lightly, my dear people of God, it is not for nothing that we speak what we speak from here on stage. My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have corrupted it. You have turned it into something which does not belong or fit in what my father wants. He wants prayer in this place. He wants an atmosphere of worship. That is why from time to time we keep checking people. Be careful when you sit in a gathering like this. Do not be distracted especially by digital devices that draw your attention away from what's happening here to whatever you're involved in. Because I know this for a fact. I have seen it with my own eyes. Especially the last row of people in certain services. They are never, never part of the service that is happening here, the church service that is happening. But almost everyone in that last row, I'm not talking about today, but I'm talking about generally. All involved in their cell phones, involved in looking at what's happening on Facebook and Instagram and all the social media platforms. Instead of focusing on the prayer and the worship that's happening, instead of focusing on the message of God that is being preached in the church. Dear people of God, you and I must understand that our God is very serious about his end of the deal. He made a covenant with us and he expects us to keep our end of the deal in the covenant that we made with him when we were saved and born again, baptized in water, and especially when we participate in the table of the Lord. You must realize and understand that participation in the table of the Lord, the drinking of the wine and the eating of the bread is a part of the covenant deal that was established first when it was done with Moses. I had asked this question when I had preached this sermon, I think sometime last year. And I keep asking certain pastors, do you know many of them are not able, in fact, none of them so far here in Lucknow have been able to answer. Jesus said, this is the blood of the new covenant. You all know the new covenant. What do you know about the old covenant? When was that covenant made? And they all gave different, uh, different occasions, uh, Abraham's covenant and this. I said, no, that is Abraham's covenant. It was not a covenant with the nation of Israel. Anyway, I'll leave that for another time. But what is it that got Jesus upset because of these guys' dealings? You have no understanding of what my father's house is supposed to be. That is what Jesus said. You have no understanding. You are trying to bring in a, sick, a secular spirit into the atmosphere which is supposed to be charged by the presence of the Holy Spirit. And not the spirit of the world. Dear people of God, you and I must understand our God is a loving God. He is a compassionate and kind and just God. At the same time, he said, I am holy and because I am holy, you be holy. And Jesus said, not in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, he said, separate yourself from the world. Be apart from the world. Don't be a part of the world, but be apart from the world. That is what Jesus expects from you and me. It is supposed to be an atmosphere with an aroma of worship rising up to God. An atmosphere of prayer with the aroma of the incense of prayer rising up to the nostrils of God. We sing that song day and night, night and day. Let incense arise. It means let the prayers of your saints arise. Let the worship of your people arise. Day and night, night and day, 24 hours, 7 days a week. In those days, the temple was the only place where the brazen halter was present. That was the only place where sacrifices were supposed to be made. 
that is why people traveled from all over the world to come to Jerusalem to offer their sacrifices they would not offer it in their places they would come to Jerusalem because that is where the brazen altar was but that is not true today what does the scripture teaches us about today it says that our body is the temple of the living god can you repeat that after me say my body is the temple of the living god not just that day but even today the question that i want to ask you and me is what is the aroma rising up from this temple what is the spirit that is found in this temple the people of god sometimes it can be very frightening when we develop an understanding of what the scripture is trying to teach us you know many of us have allowed our hearts and our minds and our spirits to be corrupted by the things of this world that is why you find the apostles time and again in every letter that they wrote in the bible they would emphasize on this one aspect cleanse yourself so that it is the spirit of god that is found in you and not the secular spirit not the worldly spirit because my house now we turn away from the temple made of bricks and stone now in the new testament the same passage holds true my house shall be called a house of prayer is that true for you and i today is it true for you that your this house shall be called a house of prayer what is the aroma rising out of this temple preaching yes but my house shall be called a house of prayer worship music yes but my house shall be called a house of now god was not twisting words he was not looking for us to delve deep into for a deeper meaning of the word prayer literally it is an atmosphere of prayer and worship that he was looking at the temple in those days had choirs they had musicians they had people they had staff members to look after the cleaning of the property the maintenance of the place they had people to take care of the trimmings on the altars all of those people were there they were necessary people but the question was did those people possess the temple spirit in those days and today do we possess the temple spirit which is the holy spirit of god is that the spirit that is driving us today now we all know this passage know ye not that your bodies are the temple of the living god but i don't want you to confuse this passage with the other passage which is similar to this which says know ye not that you are the temple of the living god a paul makes mention twice of something similar but they are not the same so turn with me to 1st corinthians chapter 3 1st corinthians chapter 3 there we find the first mention and when paul was writing this letter he he was talking about he was addressing several issues and then By the time we come to chapter 3 of course he did not write his letters in chapters but we later on when the canon was made then they divided it but to give it an appropriate topic you know there would be a topic that is given at the top of chapter 3 right what does it say it says the church and its leaders so it's talking about the church all right i want to draw your attention to verse number 16 16 What does it say there? Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your in your Please could you say it out loud in your yes. Now midst is not body it's not a person's body it's not an individual person When you use the word midst we are talking about a collective group of people So this passage 
that Paul writes about. He is pointing out to the collective church, the group of people. He says, don't you know people of God that you as a group are God's temple? As a gathering, this gathering is the temple of God, not the building, not my individual body, but the gathering. This is God's temple and he dwells in your midst, okay? In your midst. Where is the second time he mentions? 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now he is addressing a different issue. Now he addresses the lifestyle of people. And in this particular passage, he's addressing sexual immorality. Sexual immorality was something that, is pre that was prevalent then, it is prevalent today. And we find instances even in the church, which is very shameful. But he says, in verse 19, here he says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? You are not your own. Here he talks about the body. But in chapter 3, he talks about the gathering. What am I emphasizing? The temple, when we read about it in the New Testament, it is both your individual bodies, how to keep it sacred, pure, and holy, and also this temple, this gathering. Know ye not that you are the temple of the living God and that the Spirit of God dwells in your midst? It is this temple that I want to address first by saying, my house or my temple shall be called a temple of prayer. A temple of prayer. It is God's desire that we do not twist and turn or compromise the purposes of God for anything. Anything, absolutely anything. If he says that my temple should be known as a temple of prayer, that is his expectation and he doesn't want it to be compromised. But I'm very sorry to say that you and I have been busy compromising on several aspects, including this aspect. We have been having these 40 days of prayer these days. We started on the 8th of January and today is the 25th of February. We have done more than 40 days of prayer at the beginning of the year. This is not our Lent period. We do not believe in Lent. Lent is not scriptural, scriptural or biblical just before the Passion Week. I believe you should have Lent throughout the year. I believe you can have Lent in August or December. You can have Lent around the Christmas season. You can have Lent around the New Year time. Not only around the Passion Week time. Which is what it has become now. It has become such a traditional practice. That it's almost hypocritical in its entirety when people go around for prayers to different homes today and I know this for a fact in Lucknow they go to homes but they go there not for the prayer but they go there to eat once the prayer is done and I heard one of their own pastors tell me you know it is like a competition different families are competing to see who prepares better food than the other my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have corrupted it. You have changed the atmosphere. That is the only reason why, dear people of God, we insist that do not, please do not serve dinner after the prayer. Because it, it changes the atmosphere. It just disturbs what it's supposed to be. If it's just a quiet uh, after prayer dinner, uh, a conversation continues to be around prayer or the scriptures, it's absolutely fine. But then that doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. My house shall be called a house of prayer. It is very interesting to note that the first church that was established, it was birthed in prayer. When 120 people were in the upper room, what were they doing? They were praying. On the day of Pentecost, the first church was established. More than 5,000 people 
were saved and were added to their number. And that number grew daily because daily they would give themselves to the apostles' teachings, to fellowship, breaking of bread, and to prayer. 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 I underline prayer. Any revival that broke out anywhere in the world, it all began with prayer. We know about Moody. Moody went to UK, started prayer. Revival broke out. You talk about Charles Finney in the United States. He went to New York. Prayer. Revival broke out. Whether it's a Welsh revival, any revival that broke out, even our Azusa Street revival out of which the Assemblies of God was born, it all started with prayer. Because, dear people of God, it is only prayer that births anything that is associated with God, the things of God, or the kingdom of God. You know, when Jesus, when he was ministering, I don't know if you've noticed this, but when he ministered to people, he never prayed over them. Do you notice that? He never prayed. The only time he probably prayed was at the raising of Lazarus and that too, he did not pray for Lazarus to be raised. He just said, reveal your glory. He never prayed, oh God, heal, remove, set right, bring back, restore. No, he just commanded. He only commanded. That was the kind of authority he had. You know why? Because he had already prayed up. It was his practice, three o'clock, four o'clock early in the morning. He would rise up and he would commune with his father and the Holy Spirit would minister to him. He was all prayed up by the time the sun rose. He was fully anointed and the rest of the day, he never prayed one prayer. He would just minister under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. There was no need for him to pray because he had already prayed every day, every day, every day. My house shall be called a house of prayer. You remember about Peter and John when they were in prison? When they were released. Now correct me if I'm wrong, okay? And please be loud in correcting me. As soon as they were released, you know, they went to the jailer and say, take us to the magistrate. We want to go to the magistrate. We want to appeal our case. Why were we arrested? We demand our rights. We demand our privileges. No, are you sure? You're absolutely sure? Where did they go? They went straight into a prayer meeting. When Peter was in jail, when the chains fell off, he walked out. He went straight into a prayer meeting. He didn't even go home to bathe or shower. He didn't even go anywhere else to eat food because prison food is stale and is very bad. No. He didn't say, I want to go to Tunde and you know, get my stomach fill of Tunde. I was deprived of it for six months. Or go to Moti Mahal. I could not eat any of that fantastic food. So let me go to McDonald's or Burger King and grab a burger. I miss those cheeseburgers. Oh God, <laughs> you have set me free. Let me go grab a bite and then I'll go. No! They headed straight into prayer. Prayer. That's what those guys did. For anything and everything, even the decisions they made, they would pray. And that's when the Holy Spirit would direct them and tell them what to do, how to do, when to do, where to go, where not to go, and what not to say. The Holy Spirit directed them because they were a people who were given to prayer. My house shall be called a house of prayer and that's what I want it to be. That's what God is saying. Paul says, I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands. He tells Timothy, I want, first of all, I urge you, first of all, to pray. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. I want you to turn to the book of Revelations. What prayer are we talking about? God values prayers. I'll tell you how he values prayers. Turn to the book of Revelations chapter 5. Revelations chapter 5. Look into the scriptures with me when I read verse number 8. 
where it says and when he had taken it the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls say after me golden bowls say full of incense what was that incense what say it again they had golden bowls with incense and that incense was the prayers of God's people. God values your prayers enough to store them in golden bowls. How serious are you about your prayers? How committed are you about prayer? Dear people of God, God is very serious about his end of the deal my house I made it to be a house of prayer I want it to be a house of prayer I want men everywhere lift up holy hands in worship and in prayer it's about prayer when Jesus said when you pray he never said if you pray or when you think about praying he says when you pray he assumes that it is a lifestyle that you adopt that is what he wants a lifestyle of prayer not two minutes of prayer Today we see in the churches there is an opening prayer for three minutes. There will be an offering prayer for maybe one minute. That's all I take now. And then a closing prayer of five minutes. Five and three, eight and one, nine. Let's say ten minutes of prayer in the church in a 90 minute service. And God is saying my house shall be called a house of prayer. But today anything except prayer is what is occupying the timetable of a church service on a Sunday morning. When we call for times of prayer. Not even 10% of God's people make it convenient for themselves to come out and say, I am going to go join with my brothers and sisters. I'm going to go there and together we are going to lift our voices because Jesus said, if two of you agree concerning something, the greatest team of two is husband and wife. All the wives say amen. amen. No, you're not saying amen because it doesn't happen. <laughs> The greatest team of two is a husband and wife team. And Jesus very clearly said, if two of you agree concerning anything here on earth, it shall be done in heaven. And the greatest challenge is for a husband and wife to agree concerning something. God knew it. That's why he said, if two of you agree concerning something. People of God, my house shall be called a house of prayer. That is why we urge you time and again. We should be having prayers every week. Unfortunately, we do not. But whenever we do, it is for you to make it convenient. It is never a convenient thing. It is never a convenient time. Nor is it a convenient day. You have to make it convenient. If you do not work on making it convenient, it will never happen. It will never happen. It is up to you. My house shall be called a house of prayer. Today, the concept of church is so different from what God meant it to be. The book of Acts 2.42 says they continued steadfastly. And then when you read down the other verses, you get the idea that every day they would gather. Didn't they have anything else to do? Were they faltu people? Nothing else to do? No jobs? No businesses? Of course they did. How else do you think they ate? How else do you think they bought clothes? They were busy people. They were not faltu people. They were busy. In fact, we have things convenient today. They, they didn't have a car to go from place to place. So a journey from here to Hazrat Ganj is two minutes. But for them it would be 15 minutes. A journey from here to PGI by car would be 30 minutes. But for us, on walk, by walk, or if we walk, it will take you two hours. They had a paucity of time. And yet they took out time to meet every day. Every day. But today, 90 minutes. Oh God, 90 minutes. Oh yeah. Ooh, this Pastor Sammy can just drone on and on. Look at that. It's already 10.35 and he's still not even giving any signs of stopping. It bothers us that 90 minutes have gone by and still we have to sit in church. David said... I was glad when they said unto me, let us go. Better is one day in your courts. Oh, how we love to sing those songs. But jara do ghante ho jai, 
चर्च में क्या है भाई हमको और भी काम करना है यू नो दीज थॉट्स फिल आर माइंड वी आर नेवर नेवर थिंकिंग अबाउट वॉट गॉड इज लुकिंग फ्रॉम अस just one day a week we gather like this and even in that we show so much kanjusi so much kanjusi what is god looking for dear people of god my house shall be called a house of prayer we must understand that the church of jesus christ he said i am the builder so he wants it by his standards not our standards he has the blueprint we have to follow his plans not our own plans and so whenever the call for prayer goes out it is not by us it is the spirit of the lord who speaks out to the church but we are so busy looking out for excuses looking out for excuses what is the atmosphere in this temple may i ask you one more time what spirit is found in this temple has it been corrupted by the things of this world what things am i talking about jealousy hatred partiality greed lust these spirits do not belong in the church and yet very sad to say these are the spirits that are found within the church because we have allowed the atmosphere of this temple to be corrupted to be corrupted when we talk of the fruit of the spirit and we talk about the fruit of the evil that is found quantities of both which one is prevalent in your life dear people of god this morning I just pray that our homes will be temples of the living God where the spirit of God dwells where he is pleased to dwell not just dwells but where he is pleased to dwell Unfortunately in many homes there is no prayer whatsoever no prayer no worship whatsoever whether it is collective or even individual there is no worship no reading of the word no studying of the word no worshiping together as a family it is missing and i am not sorry to say this this is not what god expects and this is not what god wants if we have dedicated our homes to be a temple of the living god then his condition is my house shall be called a house of prayer and nothing else if your house is dedicated to be a house of god excuse me a house of god you will not have secular parties happening in your house you will not have secular music playing in your house you will not have secular activities happening in your house because you are set apart as a people called out from the world to be the chosen ones that we read about in peter's epistle chapter 2 verse 9 you are a chosen people you are a royal priesthood you are a what nation what nation come on say it after me holy nation if you do not know this then i am compelled to ask you to open to that passage first peter chapter 2 let us stand as we read this passage First Peter chapter two. First Peter chapter two and verse nine. I would like for us all to read this out loud together. And read it using a different. What do you call it? I, you, they, we. What are these? Pronouns. Thank you. Thank you. pronouns instead of saying you are i want you to say i am all right let's do that ready let's go but i am a chosen person i am royal priesthood i am part of a holy nation 
I am God's special possession that I may declare the praises of him who called me out of darkness into his wonderful light. Hallelujah. Do you believe that? Is that true for you today? Why don't you close your Bibles and lift up your hands to heaven this morning. This morning if you say that I am a chosen person, I am a royal, I'm part of the royal priesthood, I am part of the holy nation, then my house, uh, my body and this gathering, this is all God's temple and my heavenly father wants this temple to be a temple of prayer. Whether it is my individual life, uh, whether it is my family, whether it's my home or it is the collective church, uh, all these temples. Temples. Uh, these are all places where God wants to declare as his uh, property. He declares it to be his property. He says my house. So the question is, is it God's house? Is your house in Lucknow, is it God's house? Is your body, is it God's house? Then my house shall be called. What should it be called? The house of prayer. I want you to take this moment and just make a covenant or a commitment to God as every eye is closed. Tim, if you can come to the keyboards, please. As every eye is closed and you search your hearts and you allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you, allow the Holy Spirit to show to you those things that would probably have corrupted in some way would have corrupted your spirits whether it's an attitude or it is a feeling towards somebody or it is a behavioral a behavioral aspect or something that does not belong in you ask the Holy Spirit to show you so that you along with the Holy Spirit can get rid of that which corrupts and truly bring you to that place where you can declare my house indeed my body indeed is a house of prayer it is indeed a temple where the Spirit of God is pleased to dwell. It is a temple where it is the aroma of worship, the aroma of prayer that rises up to God. It is the aroma of prayer and the incense that rises 24-7 would be the incense of worship and the incense of prayer. Whether it's through my life or in my house, along with my family or by myself or the collective church. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit of God, you know you are searching every heart this morning. You are searching every heart. And today I just pray, Holy Spirit of God, that you would have your way. You would reveal to us those areas or those things in our lives that are not supposed to be there. <coughs> They're not supposed to be found there. I pray, Holy Spirit, you would give us the strength and you would help us to make things right. I pray especially, O oh God, for reconciliation to happen, O oh Lord, within the body of Christ, within this life spring assembly. I pray, O oh God, that people who do not see eye to eye, people who do not like each other, who do not like the sight of each other, or people who try to stay away from certain people I pray that those attitudes and those spirits will not be found I pray that reconciliation will happen you are the God who brings together you never tear people apart you do not damage relationships you restore relationships because you are a God of reconciliation and you gave to us the ministry of reconciliation so I pray Holy Spirit of God that you would help us Help us in our resolve. May we resolve to allow this temple to be indeed a house of prayer. Hallelujah. 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 Shabari Kataya Kamarandiranama. You know, tonight, once a week, we have these prayers happening in the church. And we always extend an invitation to come and join us every Sunday evening 
for this time of prayer would you make this resolve and make a commitment and say yes i will come 6:30 p.m. 6:30 p.m. i will be in the house of god i will join my brothers and sisters because this church life spring assembly is to be a house of prayer hallelujah hallelujah i am sure the holy spirit has spoken to many of us it is meant for every one of us to hear those of you who have families and your home is to be a place of prayer and prayer leads you to revival and the revival causes you to worship and worship leads you to the very throne of god and the lord said he will dwell among the praises of my people hallelujah thank you jesus and i praise god for the word that has come to us this morning it is god's word for god's people for us to take it you know the saints of god in the old old days there was a a prayer put it in a musical form i would like us to join and sing this prayer sweet tower of prayer you don't realize the sweetness and the joy that can fill your soul and your life when you give yourself to prayer so let us sing this sweet hour of prayer
were very sweet to sing and sing wonderful hymn about prayer but let it become our practice may our homes be converted from a place of distractions and quarrels and debates and disputes and arguments into a place where we say goodbye to this earth and earthly things and reach out and bring that atmosphere of heaven where the angels and cherubims and seraphims surrounding the throne of God day and night our day and night but they have no night or day but to worship hallelujah and just glorify god and god becomes the one and only important factor in our lives in our homes and in our Thank you Jesus. Lift up our hands to God. Hallelujah. And open your mouth and raise your voice as unto him who is seated upon his throne. High and lifted up where the angels cry holy 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 is the Lord God almighty who was and who is and who is to come my friends it's all about him it is not about us it is about a lord god who is worthy of all our worship and praises thank god for speaking to us lord we thank you for speaking to us and we thank you for your word and we thank you for pastor sami to whom you have given this message for us and may we accept this message for and practice it lord so that we may have a heaven within our hearts and within our homes as well hallelujah hallelujah You know the Colossians letter that Paul wrote it is all about to bringing a heaven in your home you read that epistle practice it and you will have heaven in your homes amen the throne of god must be at the center of our homes and our worship of god must be the most important noise that we make in our home and that brings victory joy and happiness healings deliverance and answers to all our questions praise the lord and god bless you